I've got a two screen set up here so I can see what you guys are seeing too. Okay, <laughs> I think we're good. <clears throat> All right, so um, today we're doing an introduction to teaching and learning. Uh, I know that this space was a little bit intimidating for me to get into it. And as a biology student, I didn't really receive any formal training on how to be a TA or how to teach. I was just sort of uh, put into this position. And um, it's such a really great space, this teaching and learning space. And I wanted to be able to share that with everyone and help introduce you all into this um, space as well. So um, I designed this workshop. It's my very first solo workshop creation and facilitation. So um, I'm very excited to be doing this and to be sharing this with all of you. Um, again, this is um, through the Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, which is a really great team, lots of support. A lot of them are here right now. So thank you for coming. Um, and I guess I'll get started in here. I've already done the land acknowledgement and the context. So um, I've already shared who I am and where, where I'm coming from and the lands that I am on now. So um, we'll go right into the concept map here. Now, what I was, what I shared with you earlier about the con, that's the context in the background. So everything that I'm presenting to you comes from my lens as uh, you know, a person who I am and my culture and, and how I've seen the world. So um, keep that in mind that this is, um, all this information has been filtered through the context of who I am and where I am. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is going to be the framework. So basically, I'm going to be bringing all of these new concepts into you. Um, and I want to give you a framework for interpreting these and um, understanding them. Um, first, I want to talk about the hermeneutic circle really quick. If you don't know what this is, this is just the concept that the more you understand about the big picture, the more you'll understand the little components of the big picture. And the more that you understand the little components of the big picture, the more you'll understand the big picture. So the more we understand about learning outcomes, the more we'll understand the instructor space, and the more we'll understand teaching and learning. And the more that we understand teaching and learning in general, the more we'll understand about learning incomes, uh, outcomes or assessments, that type of thing. So keep that in mind. You might not get the whole picture right away, but the more you understand little bits, the more you'll understand the bigger part and vice versa. So let's go right into frameworks. Then we're going to go into the scholarship of teaching and learning, go through some basics, enter up the instructor space, and then talk about the equity space. And again, I'll be going through these very quickly, but this is recorded so you guys can come back and revisit it after. And I'll also have some supplemental documents that I can share with you all um, later this week that will refresh your mind on these concepts that I'm going to talk about. So this framework, the OGs, so we have ontology, which is basically a set of concepts that dictate the nature of being. So um, how we break down uh, physical or metaphysical concepts and aspects into smaller portions that we can categorize to better understand it. Um, that leads us to the epistemology, which is how we create knowledge, the way that our individual minds relate to reality and understand it. It's basically a framework for how we as individuals uh, interpret and assess what is true when knowledge comes to us. So my epistemology may be different from someone else's epistemology. And um, that, that's very true as well for cultural. So different cultures have different epistemologies and way of, in, of taking in knowledge. So it's just something to keep in mind. Now, pedagogy is the one we really want to talk about here, and that is how knowledge and skills are transferred in an educational context. So it's basically the different, the study of the different methods of teaching. The scholarship of teaching and learning um, is basically the study of teaching and learning. So it's, it's the scholarly articles um, that come out of um, for teaching and learning. Now, this there's a wide variety of this. So we've got all kinds of different teaching and learning. We've got edu early childhood education, university teaching and learning, literacy teaching, additional languages, um, skills training. We have all types of teaching and learning. So the one that I'm going to try and focus on today, uh, which is most relevant for us, is the university teaching and learning space. Basically, there's different sources of knowledge. So um, we collect knowledge from authorities. So if an authority says this is this is a, a correct thing, then we just sometimes just take that and accept it. Traditions, common sense, media myths, personal experiences, and the scientific method. They're, these are all sources of how we obtain knowledge. Uh, and then there's different types of learning. So passive learning uh, and active learning. Passive learning is sort of like a lecture. It's basically, if we're using that, um, the definition that Paolo Freire uses in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, it's sort of like a, a bank account. And as an instructor, you just deposit bits of knowledge into your students' brains. So that's passive learning. I'm giving you the information and you're just taking it in. Sort of the way that we're doing right now. I'm just vocalizing to you information and you guys are taking it in passively. 
Um, the other form of learning is active learning, where students and, and learners are actively engaged with the material that's being presented to them. So um, this would be things like um, when they're, in, they're um, active learning that requires learners to engage with the materials by summarizing it, synthesizing it, problem solving with that information, and just, you know, generally applying the concepts and knowledge that have been obtained. Now, I want to note here that epistemology plays a large part in learning. So how we are viewing the world, how we accept information is has a big impact on um, the way that we're going to learn it. So again, the hermeneutic circle is involved here, the incommensurability. So sometimes when the epistemology doesn't line up with the teaching style, then the information doesn't make sense and it doesn't get through to the learners. So that's something to keep in mind as well. These things all fit together uh, to make up the teaching and learning space um, and individuals. So active learning is, um, you know, students are actively and experientially involved in that learning process. They're engaging with summarizing, synthesizing, problem solving, um, applying the knowledge. Examples of this would be group discussions, um, reflection pieces. So if I got every single one of you to write a reflection piece about what we learned today, that would be the active learning process versus, I don't worry, I'm not going to make you do that, but uh, versus the lecture, which is sort of how this workshop is going for now. Uh, peer reviewing is excellent for that. Um, experiential learning like fields, field work and site visits, that type of stuff. That's all active learning. Students are actively engaging with the materials that are being presented. <clears throat> so we can also fit that into the lecture format. So things like priming. So what I did at the beginning of this um, workshop or the seminar was I gave you a framework to sort of better understand what's coming. That was sort of like a priming of what we're going to be discussing, that concept map. That's also priming. Um, you know, there's lecture, brief activities, then lecture again, then a brief activity. That's, that's integrating active learning in that lecture space. So that's all the basics. Uh, let's walk into the instructor space now. Now there's three spheres here that I've identified and it's sort of like a Venn diagram. So, you know, assessments could also be within teaching. Um, so I just sort of broke them up this way, but this is not a hard line between these topics. In the teaching space, let's talk about instructional strategies, learning outcomes, and feedback. So instructional strategies are techniques used by an instructor to impart the knowledge to the learner. And then like, if you wanna flip that, learning strategies are when the student independently chooses uh, a knowledge gaining tool and uses that to gain the knowledge. Um, outcomes are the desired knowledge. So what is it that the learner should have once instruction is completed? Um, and feedback is just information about um, the effectiveness of the teaching, um, and that's used for improvement. Instructional strategies, um, something to keep in mind is that brains are unique and diverse. We all learn in different ways, and that's based on that ontology and epistemology that I discussed at the start. Um, the more diverse the strategies, the more tools students have to effectively learn. So you basically, with all these different strategies, you provide you know, different tools and students are able to pick the proper tool for them that works for them to learn. Um, some example of strategies are using case studies as examples, using um, different assessment activities, flipped classroom where lectures are asynchronous, but the assignments are synchronous. So you've got you know, different strategies that can be used. And as a TA, if you are a TA, you do have some control over instructional strategies and delivery. You could use things like exit tickets where you get your students to write down one thing they learned during your lab or your session uh, before they leave the room and that has made them actively engage with the material that you've presented to them even though you didn't decide what the material would be. Uh, learning outcomes. So now we're taking those tools and we want the students to be able to do something with it. So they're going to be building with that. So a clear summary of what skills and knowledge we want the learners to walk away with. Uh, learning outcome statements appear on a syllabus, so it's very clear. It's almost like a contract, which I'll discuss a little bit later, um, on what students can expect um, for that course. What, what knowledge, what skill will they obtain? Uh, and outcomes can be content-based, so students will be able to identify sort of maybe major geologic minerals. Um, Skills-based, so students will be able to analyze quantitative data using general additive models in R. Um, or it can be a value-based outcome. So students will be able to identify their personal position on the political spectrum. So learning outcomes can have can be you know, content-based, skill-based, or values-based. But they still just provide a guide on what the students will be able to do at the end of the instruction. Feedback. 
um, that's very essential to your personal and professional growth. Um, it's, and it's evidence of teaching effectiveness. We did do a presentation and a workshop on this earlier, and I'm sure there will be future iterations, um, an entire workshop on feedback and how to navigate that as a TA. Uh, and this is just a, a, a screenshot of one of the slides from that presentation. You've got two types of feedback, formative feedback, which occurs throughout the instruction, so real-time adjustments. So that could be as simple as uh, gauging the room for, um, you know, body language, um, are students being receptive or not? You know, that's a feedback mechanism. Oh, they're not being receptive. I need to switch something up. Um, summative feedback is at the end. So once it's complete, what were the thoughts on um, the instruction? So one can be, you can make real-time adjustments and the summative, it's uh, for adjustments for the future iterations. And as a TA, you can independently collect both formative and summative feedback. So you can like read the room, um, do a little exit survey. You've got some, some few options and, and you know, those are discussed in um, that uh, workshop on feedback. <clears throat> uh, course design. So lesson planning, um, that's basically a roadmap that an instructor, instructor uses to convey the knowledge or skills to the learner. Assessments, those are methods of evaluating the knowledge or skills that an individual or group has um, either obtained from the class or just has in general. The syllabus is a document that outlines the course's goals, expectations, and timelines. And then there's educational technology, which is digital technology used to facilitate instruction. Lesson planning is that roadmap um, that, like I said, that instructor, instructor uses to help guide them in designing a way to convey knowledge or skills to others. So it requires clear goals. So your learning outcomes, which we just discussed, uh, methods of assessment, and it requires a timeline. So things that you want to consider when you're doing lesson planning and you're coming up with these goals and assessments and timelines is who are your potential students? What skills will they already have that you can build on? Um, is the course an elective or a requirement? That's going to change how students are entering the space of your classroom. Um, what strengths do you have as an educator that you can really lean on if you're, um, you know, maybe you're teaching a topic that's really difficult for students to grasp in general? What skills can you use to help facilitate that instruction? And then assessments. <clears throat> um, these are methods of evaluating the knowledge or skill of, a, of an individual or a group. And there's really limitless possibilities here. And there's countless resources online to access to um, you know, do assessments. And this, this space is growing so rapidly. There's lots of publications, lots of resources. Uh, and again, with the feedback, you have, uh, similar to the feedback, you have formative assessments, which occur throughout the instruction. So real-time adjustments can be made. So an example, of this would be like a pre-lab quiz. Typically, these are ungraded because they're just to check to see where things are. And then you have summative assessments, and that occurs at the end of the instruction. So like a final exam, and that's where things are graded usually. And, you know, we've all probably seen this little graph of for fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam, please climb that tree. And of course, because we're diverse and our brains are diverse, we learn in different ways. We have different epistemologies, different frameworks. Um, we learn things in different ways and we express them in different ways. And so having a wide variety of assessments helps bridge that gap from um, the just the natural human variety in the way that our brains work and the way that we express ourselves and express knowledge and skill. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why assessments are, are a very important part. And of course, there's, there's a whole workshop on this that I'll plug in just a second. Um, but some examples of assessments would be like an iceberg activity where students, you know, you give them a topic and students have to identify all the underlying causes that influence that topic or event. Um, and then you've got like just in time training where you, you know, provide a <clears throat> sort of quiz or questions about what you just taught them. Um, you know, essays, posters, exams, quizzes, portfolios where students select their best work and then reflect on it and give a piece uh, about their reflections on their work. Group reports, uh, discussions, lab reports, you know, again, countless resources online. There's so much in this space and it's just really exciting to see all of this work. Uh, for more details on that, here is the plug. Um, there's assessment practices for university teaching and learning by Clarissa, who is present with us today, <laughs> uh, and Carolyn. So that's coming up uh, March 1st. Um, I will leave some links in the chat uh, when we get to the discussion part uh, that you guys can take a look and uh, register for. 
the syllabus. Um, I'm not going to play the video, but there's this amazing video online of Snoop Dogg, tell, Snoop Dogg telling everyone to just go check out the syllabus. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great little video. So the syllabus outlines the goals and expectations for a course, um, and it can have many different elements based on your institution requirements. General elements that you'll find on a syllabus are instructor information, land acknowledgement, course information, course format, the goals and outcomes like we discussed, learning outcomes, um, required texts and resources, methods of evaluations, those assessments, that, you know, what kind of assessments there will be, um, additional policies, course schedule, that type of stuff. Here comes another plug. We do have another course coming in um, on the syllabus that will be given by Sam, and um, that will be March 24th. Again, I will have a link for all this at the very end that you guys can register for what you want to get some more of. Uh, I believe Sandra just shared one there. Awesome. All right, uh, educational technology. This is another one that's growing really fast. Western, cul Western culture is evolving and teaching evolves with it. Uh, more tools are now available to enhance transfers of knowledge and skill. We got things like Zoom, Padlet, OnQ, which is the Queen's specific platform, social media, Facebook, Instagram. We got YouTube channels. We got podcasts, you know, and the CTL has a YouTube channel too, which this is probably, this workshop is probably going to end up on. There's so many resources out there and there's so many ways to share knowledge now and there's so many tools that we can use uh an example is that i'm doing this presentation right now and I've, i'm logged in on my desktop where i've got my presentation and i'm got the video but i'm also logged on on my laptop so i can actually see the group uh and what you guys are seeing to make sure that i'm doing everything it's just it's amazing there's so much technology it's a great space and it's a wonderful space to explore there's lots in there uh, I went to a seminar and <clears throat> it was really great. And the person said, uh, digital competency is a language that the youth have. They're very fluent in it. And we need to get fluent too, because we want to interact with the youth and we want to teach. Um, and uh, we, we need to come into the space and, um, you know, have fun with it. All right, the next sphere is the development and documents as a teacher. So there's teaching dossiers. That's a professional document that summarizes your beliefs, strengths, and accomplishments as an instructor and provides evidence of your experience and your abilities. There's the PUTL, the Professional Development in University Teaching and Learning. And this is a series of professional development modules that Queen's offers, the Center of Teaching and Learning offers that you do uh, for free that will help build your skills. And there's the uh, philosophy of teaching and learning, which is a one to two page written statement of an instructor's thoughts, beliefs, and core values in teaching and learning. So let's take a look at this stuff a little bit deeper. The teaching dossier is uh, like your teaching CV. So it outlines your instructor beliefs, accomplishments, abilities um, as an educator. Typical elements that you find in a teaching dossier are things like your teaching philosophy statement, teaching responsibilities, um, evidence of effectiveness, so like student feedback, that kind of thing, um, teaching strategies and innovations, um, you know, or is there a particular teaching assessment or uh, learning outcomes that you, you really gravitate towards, you know, you put that stuff in your dossier. Uh, professional development and teaching. Uh, so basically, have you taken courses like that uh, PUTL? You put that in your teaching dossier. Educational leadership, scholarship of teaching and learning, and sample teaching materials. Um, basically, the same as like a CV, but for teaching. So um, I would recommend that you keep a long standing dossier that you put everything in it, the same as the CVs. And then when you apply for something, because when you apply for a job that requires teaching and learning, uh, you typically have to provide a teaching dossier. So then you can pick and choose from your master list uh, and put that into a document. And then that's tailored to the job that you're applying for. Um, but again, another plug, we do have a, um, a series or a, a presentation on that coming up next month, February 17th, where Carolyn's going to really um, provide more information on developing your teaching dossier. So the PUTL, um, so that's a series of modules that the CTL provides to help instructors level up their teaching skills. So at the end, there's an acknowledgement of completion. Um, once you've done all five modules, currently there are five modules in the PUTL um, with two more coming soon. And um, they really just mimic the components of the teaching dossier. So it helps you to uh, form that teaching dossier and just um, level up your, your skills as a teacher. Uh, it's just, it's a really great program. And, and the EDA team at the CTL is there to help for free. So um, it, there's just tons of resources at your disposal. 
the philosophy of teaching and learning. So it's a one to two page written essay like document that just shows an instructor's core beliefs about what is truly important in teaching and learning. Um, most teachers are very passionate about teaching and learning and have core values that epistemology that ontology the way that you view the world. Um, and how does that translate into your teaching and learning what are those core beliefs so uh, these include the concept of learning the concept of teaching what are your what's your goal what's your ultimate goal for your students um, what kind of teaching methods do you like to use what assessment strategies do you have um, how do you assess learning uh, professional growth are you dedicated to growing as a as an educator you know do you take things like the putl or attend workshops that type of stuff because um, every human learns a bit differently, every human also possesses and expresses that knowledge and skill a little bit differently. And this is this philosophy of teaching and learning is um, is a good description of those things, those differences, and who you are, uh, what your philosophies are as an instructor. The equity space. Um, there's a lot going on here, so I can't obviously give you a great big description of all this, um, but I'll give you an introduction. <clears throat> accessibility and accommodation. So accessible education is a method of instructing that meets the needs of people from various backgrounds, abilities, and learning styles, while accommodation is an ad adaptation that reduces or eliminates a barrier to an individual's participation. Um, EDI, equity, diversity, inclusivity, is a term used to describe policies and programs promoting representation and participation of individuals from various identities. So there's EDI and then EDII if you add the indigenization. Uh, which is bringing something under the control, dominance, or influence of the original peoples of the area. Uh, universal design for learning uh, would be teaching and learning approaches um, that offers flexibility in the ways students access knowledge and skills and how they express or provide evidence of those knowledge and skills. So let's dive a little bit deeper. Accessibility versus accommodation. Um, accessibility takes into account the characteristics and it's a proactive um, effort. So it proactively removes the barriers without compromising the academic rigor or academic integrity. Uh, accommodation, on the other hand, is the adaptation which removes the barrier to participation of an individual. So it's basically reactive. An accommodation is reactive, whereas accessibility is proactive. And I want to talk about this just a little bit more. Um, so like the accommodation process, if we're looking at it, you know, sort of the concept of it, we're talking, um, you know, ontologically, epistemologically here, um, it views, um, it view, it's basically an individual problem rather than a systemic issue. Um, so we've got accommodation, which is an individual problem. Um, accessibility says it's a system problem and that needs to be changed. So um, also, like I said, accommodation is reactive, whereas uh, accessibility is proactive. If we look at it a little bit more in terms of disabilities and making things accessible for people with varied abilities, um, the medical model here goes through disability as an individual issue or abnormality versus a simple difference in just human variation. Uh, it's not negative, it's neutral, um, and it's not doesn't need to be uh, remedied versus just a difference that the system needs to work on. So basically, the educator is responsible to make um, an, 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 to make to remove the barriers. The educator is responsible for removing that systemic barrier and make it accessible. Whereas if we're looking at the other model, it's more that it's the individual's issue and accommodations need to be done for the individual. I hope I've expressed that right, but there's there's the, those two ways of looking at it. So then my question would be, how would you view that accommodation? Do you view it as an illness or do you view it as an identity, right? And it's just a really interesting space to explore. Um, and um, there's lots of literature on it. Equity, diversity, and inclusivity. I think a lot of people have probably seen this image as well. Um, you know, equity is fair and equitable treatment, um, access and opportunity. Diversity is multiple identities represented. And inclusivity is the thoughts and ideas of all that the individuals matter. Okay. One thing I do want to kind of pull out here is that EDII is not a checkbox. And I know a lot of um, institutions like to treat it that way uh, just because it's easier. But really, EDII is not a checkbox. EDII is a lifestyle. It's a set of core values. It's an epistemology. Indigenization, um, incorporating indigenous ways of knowing, thinking, feeling, and being into the academic space. 
So um, as an instructor, um, let's talk about indigenization versus decolonization real quick. Um, decolonization is to remove that settler centric aspect, whereas indigenization is to bring in that indigenous aspect. And I think many argue that decolonization isn't really possible because the system is just completely intertwined and built on that, those settler principles. So we can't really decolonize it without completely destroying it. What we can do though, is bring in indigenous ways of knowing, bring in indigenous ways of thinking, feeling and being into that space. So we can indigenize, but not so much decolonize. Uh, but again, this is, remember, this is the whole context here is through the lens that I have through my identity. Uh, and so, you know, these things can be up, up for uh, discussion. Um, there's Indigenous epistemology, and this is where I'm going to talk about the incommensurability problem, uh, which is really well described in this book here. Um, uh, basically, that you can't convert a kilometer to grams, right? So before you can really have a good dialogue, you need to really be on equal terms and things aren't equal right now. And we need to understand how people under how people take in knowledge and how people process knowledge in order for us to communicate uh, and express knowledge and skills, right? So we need to understand one another before we can actually begin that transfer. We need to, we need to have the same metrics. Uh, and that's, you know, a whole space on its own, but it's something to be aware of as an instructor that not everybody learns the same way. We have different epistemologies. We learn different ways. Uh, and Indigenous pedagogy is a thing. There is a way of learning and a way of being. And uh, the more we bring this into the space, the academic space, the more people will have access to the space. Um, yeah, and if we're talking about Indigenous pedagogy, all teachers are learners, all learners are teachers. So it's a very strong value that as an instructor, we are still learning. We are learning from our students as just as our students are learning from us. And that's something to uh, really keep in mind in teaching. Universal design for learning. Um, so these, this is basically brings in flexibility in learning and brings in flexibility in the assessments of learning. So I talked earlier about those assessment tools. Um, we've got all these different tools that are now that we want to present as options for our students to learn. And then we want to assess that learning in various ways because people will express their knowledge in different ways. The principles of universal design for learning are engagement. So learners make choices. They feel as they're part of the process. Assignments are relevant to their lives. They see the value in it. <clears throat> and skill building is sort of like a game. It makes it fun. There's got to be representation. So this is those instructional strategies that I spoke about earlier. Um, audio learning, visual learning, hands-on, all these different types, um, you know, like the iceberg activity, all those types of um, different assessments. It's a very large space. Um, action and expression. So this is the assessments. How are we going to quantify the knowledge? How are we going to measure the knowledge and skills that have been imparted on the students? Written exams, oral reports. We want a wide variety of those too. Just like we had a wide variety of tools, we want to have a wide variety of assessments so that we're um, it's available to all the different um, students and the different styles of learning. I do want to put a word of caution here though, because this does tend to be a trap that a lot of institutions and people might fall into um, is the standardization. So we want to make, we want to have a lot of tools. We don't want to just standardize one tool that we think most people can use. Standardization erases individuality. Um, and although it saves time and energy for the instructor to just make one blanket statement for everybody, it can be very dehumanizing to learners. And uh, Paolo Friere in his book, Pedagogy of the Press, discusses this, this aspect. All right, that was a lot. Uh, and I went through that very quickly. So let's revise the concept map here. What did, what did we just all go through? Um, we discussed the ontology, epistemology, and pedagogy. And remember that hermeneutic circle. Uh, we discussed a lot of stuff. And now that you've understood this, you understand the, the learning space, the teaching and learning space a little bit better. And as you go on the next day, tomorrow, the day after, next week, and as you do more instruction, you'll better understand what a learning outcome is and you'll better understand an assessment. And then we'll just kind of keep going in this circle um, and continue on um, your learning of this space. Um, we've talked about the basics, the teaching instructor space, um, and we've also talked about the equity space. We've touched on a lot of stuff and I did it very quickly. Um, <clears throat> to further what we've discussed, 
Um, there's journals. So I'm going to, again, in, within this week, I'm going to send you a list with a bunch of links and a bunch of resources for you to, uh, as well as the concept map so that you can revise these things and sort of explore whatever topics you find were more interesting. So there's lots of different ways uh, to taken this information, you can do some reading, which we, most of us are very familiar with in our academic settings. Um, there's a big list of journals that deal with specifically education, the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, there's books, there's general books, there's textbooks, there's YouTube channels on this stuff, um, documentaries, workshops, uh, CTL has workshops going too, but you can also find some online podcasts that discuss this specifically. There's conferences that happen on teaching and learning in the university setting. Uh, and there's also chatting, which is a really great way of learning. Um, you can chat with people in your department. So there's, is there, you know, um, instructors in your department that you find are just like really excellent instructors, you know, sit down and have coffee with them, chat with them a little bit. Um, get a Zoom call or something. Um, and the CTL, there's a lot of us at the CTL. This is what we do, teaching and learning. That's our jam. Uh, you know, reach out to us and send an email, say, hey, I'd like to discuss this a little bit more. We'll have a little one-on-one -on -one Zoom chat and, and we'll just discuss it, have some tea and chat about teaching and learning. And, you know, we love this stuff. So there's a lot of options um, for you to, to explore this space. And hopefully, even though I went through this real fast, uh, I'm really hoping that I piqued your interest and that there's some topics that you might um, want to explore a little bit more. I did reference uh, some uh, materials. So those are uh, shown here. But again, I will send something around um, later this week that has all this information that you can look up if you like. I'm going to round out by reminding you all of that context, right, of the land that we're on right now and, and the lens that I brought to this these topics um, and the way that I structured it all out. I am going to um, say thank you, Miigwech, for um, listening to me. And I do want to have, I've got lots of time for a discussion. So we can go back and look at the slides, whatever slides you want. Uh, and I just, I'd like to hear what you guys think. What, what topics are interesting you? What, uh, what do you want to explore? Um, and do you have any resources? I'd, just, I'd like to see uh, 